Gosh, what an incredible praise and worship experience uh, that we just had. And I hope you guys are able, whether you're in your living room, you're in your bedroom, your kitchen, wherever you are, to just, just for a second longer, just kind of stay in that moment, just reflecting on the goodness of God, what he's brought you through, what he's going to take you through before we get ready to get into this word. I mean, thank God that we are still in the midst of this pandemic, able to just lift him up in praise. I just praise God. Uh, for this moment that all of us were able to share and experience. And now as we get ready to transition to the word, uh, I am actually super excited that we're getting ready to start our brand new series entitled The Last Dance. Uh, and to be quite honest, it was inspired and is inspired uh, by that documentary that really is just sweeping us by storm and probably because we don't have much else to watch. But man, I'm telling you the concept uh, is this that we want to just lay out and I'm going to repeat it again uh, when we get into the message that how would we live our lives if we knew that 2020 was our last dance and that's really where we're going in this series today and I want to start it off by dealing with this individual Hezekiah who actually had a similar chance and opportunity with this idea of the last dance. So if you guys are ready to get into the word, I am super excited about this five part series that we're about to be in. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 20. And I actually wanna start at verse 13 and read just a few verses down to verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 20 verses 13 through 15. And here is what the Bible says. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. And then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what do these men say? And from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country from Babylon. And then Isaiah asked him this incredible question. What have they seen in your house? So with your prayers and God's help, I want to spend a little time as we launch our new series, The Last Dance, part one, if only you knew, if only you knew. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, um, as we get ready to open up the word, it's going to be a challenging one for us and sobering in, in some instances, particularly with the days and times that we live in. But I pray, God, that this word would go forth and that it would touch us in a way that would open up our hearts to really do some introspection and to look deep within us and ask ourselves a question, what really would we do if we knew that 2020 was our last dance? So we love you, we praise you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. There is this incredible film that came out in about 2011. Justin Timberlake was a star and it was titled In Time. And to be quite honest, whether you're a sci-fi buff or not, this movie and the concept completely and totally uh, just blew my mind. And here's how In Time worked. The currency during this time in this particular film was not money, but it actually literally is time. People didn't age past 25 when it comes to looks, but what happened is everybody on their arm had the amount of time that they actually had left before they were going to die. So every day that they would go throughout their lives, you would see a countdown of their time going down from whatever it started, if it started at 24, if it was at 48, if it was at 700, whatever it was, you would see this countdown consistently taking place on your arm. And then when you worked a job, you didn't get money, you actually got more time. Because remember, the currency actually is time. And you would actually see the time get added or taken away from whatever it was that you were doing. So if you go to a, a, a grocery store and buy groceries, uh, you would you lose time. If you would go to a coffee shop, it would cost you time. If you would go to a restaurant on a date, not only would you literally waste time or use your time by sitting there in the date, but you also, to pay for the meal, it would cost time. And so in this particular world, what was so interesting and crazy is literally everything that you did cost you time. And so you had to ask yourself the question before you went on this date, before you took the bus, before you got that cup of coffee, you had to ask yourself the question, do I have enough time 
to get coffee? Do I have enough time to get on the phone? Do I have enough time to go on this date? Because time was the currency. And you recognize how much time you had every single second of the day you knew. And so people were always on this constant grind to try to get more time, but then they were also careful of how they spent their time because if you didn't have a well-paying job, you didn't have enough time. And so it was this interesting concept that was going back and forth throughout this film about how people use their time. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that was interesting also in this film is that the difference between the rich and the poor was actually the fact that the rich had more time and the poor did not have as much time. And so it was interesting, this one scene, Justin Timberlake is sitting there in this restaurant and he's eating some food and the lady could tell that he was from the poor district and he was like, well, how do you know? And she said, because you eat fast, you're always in a rush because Justin Timberlake as an individual who's poor did not have a lot of time. But here was the interesting thing about this movie and the question that it really leaves a lot of people with. Justin Timberlake runs into this rich guy who is literally 200 plus years old because he just has so much time. And he decides that he's ready to end his life. And so what he does is he connects his arm to Justin Timberlake. He knocks him out so he's, he, he's, he, he's, he's asleep. And he connects his arm and he literally gives Justin Timberlake all of his time. It was like millions upon millions of hours that Justin Timberlake now was going to be able to have. And then the man expires, but he left Justin Timberlake a note. And when Justin Timberlake wakes up, he looks at this note and it simply says, don't waste my time. And the movie really ask us a very interesting question that I think we have to delve into. And while it is fiction, it actually is a reality because the movie asks us this question. What would you do with your life if you knew every second of the day how much time you had left? Like, how would you spend your day? Like, what kind of relationships would you have? What kind of people would you be with that normally you wouldn't be with? What kind of people would you not be with that normally you are with? What places would you go? What kind of books would you read? What kind of things would you do if you knew on your arm a countdown every single second how much time you had left? And while we really don't have that countdown on our arm, here's the thing that we do have. We do know that on this earth, we have a limited amount of time. If it's one thing that we do know on planet Earth, we will not live forever. And so although we don't see it, there is legitimately a countdown that is taking place in each of our lives. And time is actually the great equalizer. Whether we're rich, whether we're poor, whatever category, ethnicity of life or walk of life we find ourselves in, time is a great equalizer. All of us have the same amount of time. The issue is not our ability to get more time. The question is, what do we do with the time that we have? And so what I want to do for this series is really ask us this question. You don't know the countdown. It's not on your arm. But what would you do if God were to come to you and let you know that your last year here on this planet is actually going to be 2020? And when I say this last year is, is, is going to be your last, I'm not talking about being able to rewind, have no COVID-19. I'm saying just as things are, how would you and I make use of our time if we knew that 2020 was our last dance? And that's why I want to ask, ask us that question. And that's why I want to delve in and I want to lay the foundation for the series dealing with an individual who was actually in a very similar situation to what took place in that movie. And I want to see what did this guy Hezekiah do with the time that he had left. In 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah is sick. Now, this seems like it would be normal, you know, everybody gets sick every now and then. But this sickness actually is a little different. This sickness brings the prophet Isaiah to the doors of the palace of Hezekiah's uh, kingdom. And as Isaiah gets there, he goes up to Hezekiah and he really lays this out to him. He says, look, bro, get your house in order for this sickness you are not going to be healed from, but you are actually going to die. And then Isaiah turns around, no more words of comfort, and walks out of Hezekiah's quarters. Now, here's the thing that is startling about this particular passage and individuals who are reading this during this time within this context, it catches their attention in a very unique way. Because one of the things that we find out about Hezekiah is during this time in his reign, he is 40 years old. Now, if you were to have a sickness that killed you at about 40, even by today's standards, that would be young. In biblical standards, it's like he's a baby. There's absolutely no way a 40-year-old like Hezekiah should die at this age from a sickness. 
But not only that, but Hezekiah is a righteous man. Like there were so many kings before him that were living trifling lives, but Hezekiah has done some incredible things for the kingdom of God. He has torn down the idols and he's got them back to the worship of Yahweh, the true God. He has lived an incredible life for God. And in the Bible times, usually individuals who are righteous live long and those who are wicked, they would not live long lives. And so this whole thing is being flipped on its head. And now when we look at this particular story, we see a young, righteous man getting ready to experience death. And the author wants us to understand something about death and its partner time in this particular context. That death is 1000% unfair and it comes for all of us. It is not something that we can avoid even if you live right, even if you're eating right, even if you're as healthy as you can be and you are living as righteous as you can be. Ever since sin entered into this planet, there has been this thing called death that has found its way into humanity. And death is not prejudice. It takes all of us out whenever it seems to be able to come. And sometimes it comes in moments where we don't expect it. And sometimes it comes when we do expect it. But it is coming for each of us. Just this week, our church suffered a tremendous loss from a young man who went from us far too soon. And what this text wants us to understand is that if death is coming at us this way, it's like a a predator that is constantly stalking us, then the manner in which we must face life must be within the context that death can come for any of us at any time. And this is not sitting here to scare us. This is not sim simply here to put us on some kind of notice so we walk around timid and afraid because we're going to see how Hezekiah faces this thing. But in the face of COVID-19, when we go outside, we see people in masks and it's not because they're simply afraid of catching a virus. It's because they know that this virus can lead to death. And at one time we thought it was only for those who were older, but now we recognize that the virus doesn't discriminate. It comes for all and it can take all of us out. Death is around us. We're getting death tolls being told on the news over and over and over again. And the question is, in the face of death, how is it that we will live our lives knowing that at any moment and at any time, death can come upon us. Hezekiah is a young man living for the Lord, not expecting any of this to come his way. But unfortunately now, Hezekiah has to deal with this thing called death head on. And the question is, how does Hezekiah handle this and how will we? The Bible simply says that he turns to the temple and he actually begins to pray, begins to cry, but he says this particular prayer and I love what he says. He says, Lord, remember. Now, this is interesting. It blew my mind when I saw this because I said, man, wait a second. He's at the end of his life and he's literally calling upon God and asking him to remember how he has lived his life and how he has walked. And that's totally contrary, I think, to what a lot of us have been taught and what we've been taught to say when we get to the end of our lives. Because when we get to the end of our lives, we're always taught that with this end time and probation, we need to ask God to forget, to forget all of our sins, to forget the way that we've lived life. But Hezekiah has lived his 40 years so close and wrapped up in God that he doesn't ask God to forget, he asks God to remember. And that's the challenge that I want to have for each of us. What if we lived our lives in such a way that if death were to come to our door and we had a moment to talk to God before death comes, what if we were able to say, God, I don't need you to forget these things in my life. I need you to remember. Remember how I've always loved like you've loved. Remember how I've always forgiven given like you've forgiven. Remember how I've been kind to my enemies. Remember how I've lived a pure and righteous and holy life in you. What if we lived our lives in such a way that when we got to the end, we didn't ask God to forget, but we asked God to remember. And I think that's the challenge in the way that I want to challenge each of us, myself, of course, included, how we want to live life. I want to live life so confident in my walk in Jesus that I want him to remember and not have to forget. Now, I know it's great that God does forget, and I'm so glad that he forgets all of our sins. They're cast into the sea as far as the east is from the west. But here's something else I think I found out about uh, Hezekiah and his understanding of the gospel. 
By the time he gets to the end of his life, he's not trying to go through a checklist of all the sins that maybe he has, hasn't gotten forgiveness for, the things that he's committed. Because his walk with Jesus is so intentional, his walk with God is so tight that Hezekiah can face death knowing that he's been forgiven. And that's what I want us to have. I want us to have this, this relationship with Jesus, which I'm about to get into in a moment, that when death comes our way, we are confident that our lives have been washed in the blood of Jesus, that in those last moments and that in these last times, that we are not sitting there worried about, well, am I saved? Am I forgiven? Is everything going to be okay? No, no, no. We have that promise and confidence in Christ Jesus, and that only comes through a walking relationship with him. And that's where I want to transition to next. I want you to notice what Hezekiah says. He says, Lord, I want you to remember how I've walked with you. Now that Hebrew word for walk is an incredible word. And, 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 and this, this blew my mind. It's actually the same word which is used to describe Enoch walking with God. So sometimes we think that Enoch was the only one that walked with God, but actually no, the same Hebrew word that describes Enoch walking with God is the same Hebrew word that describes Hezekiah's walk with God. And I want to put a pin in that for a second because I want you to think about this. Both of them have this incredible walk with God. One of them is translated, the other one's about to see death. Now, when you look at that, that's not fair. But if you're truly walking with God, you're not worried about whether it's translation, whether or not it's death. You're just focused on your walk. And our walks clearly are different because Enoch's walk, although had the same principle, although is with the same God, led to him being translated. And Hezekiah's walk, although the same kind of walk as far as principle, led to him having to face death. And so what I want to let you know is that as we're walking with God, we cannot expect our walks to always get the same exact thing that we see somebody else's walk getting. The important thing is to know that you are walking with God. Now, you're probably saying, now, Pastor, what is this idea of walking with God? I hear this all the time. And, and I wish there was this very specific list that we could look at what Enoch's walk looked like, what Hezekiah's walk looked like. And quite honestly, if there was a list in the Bible, if the Bible described Enoch's walk, if the Bible described Hezekiah's walk point by point, bit by bit, all of us would be trying to copy that word for word. Like we'd be trying to do that all the way. And God doesn't want that. He wants our walks to be individual with him. And here's why I see that even further. And, and this thing blew my mind. The Hebrew word for walk means to flow like water with somebody, to flow like water. Now, Bruce Lee, who is the greatest martial artist uh, of all time, actually said that when it comes to martial arts, we're to be like water. And here's one of the ideas of why it's important to be like water and why I love this concept of walking with God being like water. So right here, I have this, uh, this mason jar full of water. You see the mason jar, the water is just in there. It fits perfectly, no issues. But now what's, what I could do here is I'm going to pull out this bowl. Now, the bowl looks completely different than the mason jar. But look at what happens when I pour the water inside of the bowl. The water fits exactly how the bowl is shaped. The water actually conforms and transforms to the shape of the bowl. Now, if I were to take this same bowl and then take that same water and pour it now into something that has a completely different shape, notice what the water does. The water just ends up taking the form and the shape of whatever it is poured into. And that is what walking with God is like. It is like being like water. Because as we're walking with God, he's going to be taking us into so many different places, so many different circumstances where he wants to do some things to our character. He wants to do things in and to and through our lives. And if we are not like water, being able to take the form of wherever place Jesus takes us, then we'll always be pushing back and fighting against our walk. As a matter of fact, I think some of our lives, when it comes to our walk and relationship with Christ, are more like an ice cube, right? Where we're frozen in place and we only have one shape. And so there's only certain things that God can do with us along that walk because of the shape that we've constantly and always taken because we're just frozen in place. But God, what he needs to do with his love and on this walk is he wants to melt us and turn us into that thing called water so that wherever we go in him, we'll be able to 
to flow and take the shape of whatever it is that he has for us in our lives. And so our challenge is to allow God to be able to melt us in our lives along this walk. And as his love melts us, he can trust us to take us wherever it is that he's going, knowing that just like this water took the shape of whatever was poured in, whatever Jesus pours into us and rather we get poured into, that we'll be able to take that shape that our Heavenly Father has for us. And so Hezekiah has this incredible walk with God where throughout his life he is taking whatever shape and form that Christ has for him. He's not frozen, he's not ice cold, he's melted and ready to be and walk with Jesus freely. But here's what I think is, is very interesting about something after Hezekiah uh, finishes with this prayer. Isaiah is getting ready to leave when all of a sudden God stops him and says, hold up, hold up Isaiah. I need you to go back and let Hezekiah know something, that I've heard his prayers and that I have seen his tears. Now, I have to stop here for a moment because I think that's just, that, that, that's so huge. The idea that not only that God heard his prayers, but the idea that God saw his tears. Because what I need to let somebody know today is that we serve a God that doesn't just hear us, but we have a God and serve a God rather who is looking at us. He's looking for us because I know that there were some times in my life where my life is so broken and I am in so many pieces that if he was listening for me, he would never hear me because I'm not talking. I'm in such a broken state that I have no words to say, that I am so despondent and in so much despair that I cannot even articulate the words and all I have is my tears. All I have is laying on the floor in the fetal position. All I have is my hands and my face. All I have is, is my hurt. But God does not simply listen for prayers, but he looks for my language in my body. He he looks for the way that I am presenting myself. He looks at my depression. He looks at my brokenness and all of those things, depression, brokenness, tears, anger, despair, those are all prayers to God because our heavenly father isn't just hearing for our words, but he's looking at us. And so even when you think God can't hear you, it's all right because he's looking at you and he's looking for you and he always has his eyes on you and whatever position your life is in, your life itself is a prayer to God, a crying out to God. And so sometimes God will come into your life and you'll be saying to yourself, but I never asked him to. Yes, you did because he saw you. And when he saw your condition, your condition was a prayer to him. So Isaiah goes back to Hezekiah and he says, look, dude, the Lord is going to answer your prayer. Like you are not going to die. And Hezekiah, in, in, in a very uh, you know, righteous way, not self-righteous, but this is nothing wrong with asking God for a sign. He's like, look, if God is really going to do this thing, then, then I need a sign. And I love what Isaiah says. He said, well, well listen, here's what we'll do. Um, you know how you tell time the sun, you know, covers a certain amount of the steps with its shadow so you can get an idea of the sundial about what time it is during the day. He says, we're going to have it move forward, uh, you know, six, you know, six bases as it's regular, as it normally does. And then you'll know that that's what, how God has answered your prayer. And so Hezekiah is like, no, wait a second. This is God we're talking about. He's like, I need to know the, the, the sundial naturally does that. He's like, what I want it to do is go backwards six bases. In other words, when the sun is supposed to actually be setting, I want it to actually begin to rise a little higher. In other words, if this is really God, then the nature is going to do the opposite of what it normally does. And here's the news that I think is just so incredible, that God is so invested in us and God wants us to know so bad that he is listening and that he is watching, that he will reverse the very course of nature just to let one of his children know that I have seen your tears and I have heard your prayers. And that's an awesome God to know that we can come to him and say, God, if this is really you, I'm not going to ask you to do something easy. I'm not going to ask you to do something simple. I'm going to ask you to do something God-like. And when we challenge God that way, God gets excited because sometimes we ask God to show us a sign and to do stuff in our lives that anybody could do. But God wants us to challenge him with some God stuff. And the things that I love about God, the thing that I love about God the most is that he will reverse nature. He will reverse life itself if he had to just to let one of us know that I got you, that I'm with you. Only problem is we just don't challenge him for that. But Hezekiah does. 
And so Hezekiah's prayer is answered. And Hezekiah is told that he has an extra 15 years to live. Hezekiah, just like what happened to Phil Jackson in the documentary in The Last Dance, Jerry Krause, the GM, called him into his office and let him know, hey, look, dude, you got one year left on your contract after this. That's it. Same thing happens to Hezekiah, except he doesn't have one year. He has 15 years. But it's incredible. Hezekiah knows how much time he has left. And so the question now is asked, like, what is Hezekiah going to do with these 15 years? Like, what, how is he going to live his life? with the rest of the time that he has left. And we get that answer, and I think we're going to learn something about ourselves when it comes to what would we do if we knew that 2020 was our last year. So um, the king of Babylon, who was into astrology, notices one day that something crazy has happened with the sun. He says, wait a second. The, 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 the sundial is, is moved back. The sun, when it was supposed to set actually began to rise. Something's up with this. What's going on? He also had heard rumors that Hezekiah had been sick and he starts to put two and two together and he recognizes that, wait a second, this whole idea of the sun moving back, that has something to do with Hezekiah. So he gets all of his company together and they go down to pay Hezekiah a visit. Now, this is incredible. Hezekiah has never, ever had to reach out to Babylon. He is never in order to move forward in his ruling of the kingdom in order to do what he needed to do. He never needed to form an alliance with the king of Babylon, never needed to do anything like that. But now this king, who has all kinds of riches, has a lot, big entourage that he brings with him, now shows up to Hezekiah's doorstep. So Hezekiah says, bet, man, you, you here. Why don't I take you and show you around the place? And so he starts going throughout his palace and he starts showing the king of Babylon all of his goods and all of his treasury and all of the things, material things that he has accumulated throughout his time being ruler of Israel. And all of a sudden, Isaiah shows up. Now, you know, when a prophet shows up, he's got something to say, good news or bad news. And so Hezekiah is probably wondering what on earth is Isaiah 1. Now Isaiah begins to talk to Hezekiah. He says, Hezekiah, I noticed that the king of Babylon is here. Now I'm trying to figure out, like, like, why would they need to be here? You don't need to set up an alliance with them because you don't need other people to do what God is already promised to do through you. Your kingdom has increased not because of your partnerships with men, but because of your partnerships with God. And so he's like, what, what were they doing here? And he says, well, you know, they were coming to visit, you know, just kind of check on, you know, check on me, see how I'm doing. And then Isaiah asked him this question. What have they seen in your house? Bro, they're here. They've come from far away. They don't believe in God. And now they've shown up to your life. They've come to your doorstep. And the question I've got to ask is that God extended your life, Hezekiah. And here's this incredible opportunity for people to learn about Yahweh because of the great miracle he's performed in your life. He has extended your life, and now you have an opportunity to share with them what God has done. So I'm just asking you this question. Now that they've shown up, what have they seen in your house? And I think that's an incredible question that we need to ask ourselves. Because if God has extended our lives like he did Hezekiah, and maybe God has let us know that 2020 could be our last year, or if God let us know the amount of time we had left, and then God works this incredible miracle in our lives like he did with Hezekiah, Hezekiah used the extra time to build up himself as opposed to impacting somebody else for the kingdom. And I think that's the issue that we must wrestle with within our lives is that if God gave us this extra time and if God told us that this is our last dance, this is our last contract, would we use that time to impact our own lives, to build ourselves up? Would we say, all right, I got this much time left. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to do the things that I knew I never could have done. I'm going to make risks that I normally wouldn't take, and it's all going to benefit me. Or would you find some way to make this last dance of 2020 beneficial to impact somebody else's life? And that's what happens, I think, with us. I think we spend most of the time that we have left not impacting others, but more trying to build our own kingdoms. 
more trying to show off maybe some of the things that we have in our life or try to build up our own treasury, trying to build up our own lives. And I wonder if we had a different mindset that said, God, with the last bit that you've given me, because although we might not be called into the office of God and he's telling us we're on our last contract, I believe we ought to live our lives that way. I think we ought to live our lives where we say, you know what, if this is the only year I have left, if this is the only day I have left, now how can I impact me? Now how can I build up me? But how can I build up God's kingdom? How can I impact somebody else for Jesus Christ? How can I take the time I have left to leave a mark on somebody else's life for Jesus? So that's really the question we have to ask. Like, what will people see in our house, in our life, in 2020, if this is our last year, what will they see? Like, what is it that they're going to come in contact with? Will they come in contact with a person who is just living their life with, with, with such purpose? Which, and we're going to talk about that for the rest of these weeks. But with such purpose and such focus that it leaves a lasting mark and impact far beyond when, when, when they leave this earth, far beyond when, when, when they are gone and their existence is no more uh, here. How will our lives be remembered? What impact will we leave? And if God lets us know that we only have a certain amount of time left, my challenge to each of us is to make the most of it, not by bettering ourselves, but by bettering the world that we are going to leave behind. And that's a mistake that Hezekiah made. What an incredible opportunity to use that blessing, that miracle, to share with some Babylonians the power of God, impact that life, and change the entire nation. As a matter of fact, there were some historians and, and scholars that suggest that had Hezekiah poured into them in that moment the principles and the love and the miracle of Yahweh, that Babylon would have been converted. But he didn't he use the last bits of his life and this opportunity of his life, and he squandered it away by showing them his treasures. And that's, again, the question we have to ask. Is if 2020 is our last year, what will they see in our lives? There's this uh, incredible movie, Gladiator. I'm sure a lot of us have seen it. And Maximus, uh, the star of the movie, The Gladiator, says these words that what we do in life echoes in eternity. And what that, that statement really is trying to get us to understand is that what we do with the time that we have left, whether we know it or not, whether we know for sure it's our last dance, what we do know is that what we are doing here, the effect and the life that we're living here, has uh, deposits or withdrawals on this thing that we as Christians call eternity. Um, I want you to look at this. Imagine that this, that this rope here just represents eternity. And that it just, you know, it just goes on forever and ever. I know it doesn't, it just kind of gets to the edge of this table, but imagine that this entire rope is eternity. This entire cord, excuse me, is eternity. And this space right here represents the time that you and I have on planet Earth. All this is eternity. But this represents the time we have on planet Earth. And I want you to think about how we live life a lot, right? Like we'll make decisions and do things with our life because we say to ourselves, well, man, if, if I don't get married here, then I'm not going to be able to have kids over here. And if I don't finish school here, then, then I won't be able to, 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 to get my career going over here. And, and it's so interesting that I think a lot of us live our lives, regardless of how much time we know we have left, to kind of move from here to here. That's what we do. Like, we are consumed by this. Like, this is what drives how we live our lives. This is what drives the decisions we make, the relationships we form, the impact we want to make. We do all this here. But here's what we forget. That what we experience here actually affects all of this. All of this, our eternity, is affected by the decisions that we're making here. And here is the challenge that I think I want each of us to have with this idea of the last dance. We need to live every single day of our lives knowing that what we do here affects all of this. And I'm okay missing out on something here 
as long as I don't miss out on all of this here. Because whatever you're not getting here in this life, whatever kinds of disappointments, whatever kind of pain, whatever thing you think you might be missing out on here, I promise you all of this is going to make up for it. And so I want you to stop living your last dance and living life as if it was your last dance, making decisions that only affect here when God wants us to make decisions that affect all of this. And I believe if we can start to live our lives that way, then we will be able to make the most of 2020. And if God should allow us to live even past then, every single year of our lives, I want us to live like it's the last dance, the last dance on planet earth that is preparing us for eternity. And see, when we start living like that, then when COVID-19 and these crises come, sickness comes or or maybe even a diagnosis comes or or something happens in our life that switches things all the way around we're not afraid we're not fearful because we have been living a life that is ready for eternity and it's not ready for eternity later it's ready for eternity now because we've been living life like it's our last dance and so if there's somebody out there listening and, and, and watching today And you're saying, Pastor, I've been living my life just for here. I've been living my life for the here and now. I haven't been living with eternal implications. I have not been living like this is my last dance. I've been living my life as if I got time. I'll figure it out later. But Jesus says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. I want to grab a hold of you today. And I want to do some incredible things with you today. And so if that is you. I want you to just right here, we're going to put a pin. If you're watching on Facebook Live, there's going to be a pin in the comment section for you to click that link that says next steps. And maybe you want to take that next step in your experience with Christ. If you're watching through our website, you can just go on top and you'll see from where you're viewing, you'll see another little tab there that says next steps. And it's going to take you to this page where you're going to be able to make a decision to take your next step in your journey. Some of you are watching, you're already Christians, you've given your life to Christ. But what you want to do is you want to be a part of this church family. You want to be a part of this group. We're social distancing, but we're still finding ways to connect. So you want to join a group. I want you to do that in the next step. You want to be a part of a Bible study. Learn more about God. Take your already existing walk with God deeper. If you want to do that, sign up for one of our Bible studies. But then there's somebody else that's like sitting back and you're like, yo, I've never decided to really walk with God. Or maybe I used to walk with God, but I broke up with him and I started walking with someone else. But now I want God to take me back. I want you to sign up for baptism because you need to reconnect and give your heart to Christ. And yes, even in the midst of this COVID-19 and you not being a building, that does not stop you from giving your life over to Jesus. And we want you to do that. And we are honored here at Mount Rubidoux to help you facilitate that journey. So click on that link, next steps. Take the next step in your journey with God so that you can be prepared for your last days. So I wanna pray with you right now, Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for just giving us another chance, another opportunity of life. Every day that we wake up is an opportunity for us to live out our lives as if this was our last dance. And we want to live it like Hezekiah, not in fear, not not in worry, not in trepidation, but but, but in boldness and in confidence. And through the rest of the series, we'll, we'll talk more about what that specifically looks like. But God, you have given us just another opportunity by allowing us to be alive. And we want to make the most of that life. We don't want to squander it away. We don't want to just just waste it on reckless living that doesn't affect eternity and impact other people's lives. So help us to have a last dance mindset when it comes to you. Knowing that this is it. That this could be our last year. And we want to make it the best year possible, even in the face of all this tragedy. And so, Father, we love you. I thank you for everyone who has made all of these decisions today, these next steps that they're going to be taking, and we are honored that we'll be able to take those steps with them here at Mount Rio. So God, be with us all, especially when you come. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank everyone so much for joining us uh, as we just kicked off our new series, The Last Dance, and I pray that it was able to be an incredible blessing for your life. Now, what we want you to do is take this message. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it with somebody. Let them know, hey, look, there's something I believe is going to benefit 
help your life wherever it is that you may be in your walk of life. I believe this is gonna be something that will pour into you. Share that with somebody. If maybe you know somebody who missed it, we wanna let you know that we have a rebroadcast that takes place on Sundays with our Withstander Academy, which takes place at 11, that's just for kids. But then we're gonna have our sermon, which takes place at 11.30, and that's gonna be streaming on Facebook and our website on Sundays. You can let somebody know about that. As always, we wanna thank you again for joining us, for how you've just blessed this ministry. Um, as you are watching this right now, I'm at the church grounds getting ready to pass out some more food, and I wanna thank you guys so much for your support in that we've been able to feed our community because of what it is that you've been doing. I'm so glad that we've got more and more people every single day joining groups. And again, for you who are joining us for our online worship experience. So thank you again for watching. We will see you on next week. Until then, continue to love, continue to grow, and continue to serve.